them sometime. <laughs> Let me get that back. Oh, I did. Good. <clears throat> Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your love today. And we just want to know how we can experience your closeness and that let it begin right here, right now, in a new way for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Sometimes we wonder where the Lord is, whether he's paying any attention to us or not. Let me tell you something. You couldn't get rid of him if you wanted to. This is very clear in the scripture. If you go to the heavens, if you go down below the earth, if you go to the ends of the sea, to the east, to the west, you can't get rid of him. You know, he doesn't need a, um, a camera, you know, the C, what do they call it, CEC or C, what do they call those cameras anyway? That, that are at the intersections and at banks and at businesses and along the street, and they catch so many crimes that way now, don't they? But God doesn't need a camera on you. He doesn't need to send his watchers and his holy ones to check up on what you're doing and keep a close record, although they may do that for all I know. He doesn't need any of that because he himself is with you more than you can imagine at every moment. I used to think God was with me as in by my side. Did you ever think that? I I'd, I'd try to visualize, you know. Okay, passenger seat's empty in the car. Okay, well, God, he, he could be there, you know, because he's here with me, and he might as well sit instead of standing or, or riding on the roof or whatever else he would do in my car, <laughs> sit in the back seat. So I, I, I'd welcome him to sit in the passenger seat, you know, why not? <laughs> but it's so much closer than that. See, he's not just watching. Oh, no, 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 no. No, he's monitoring. In fact, lately in my prayers, I've come to saying, God, this is how I feel. And I think, wait a minute. You know how I feel better than I do. You know what I'm thinking better than I do. You not only know what I'm thinking, but you know why I'm thinking it. And everything that went into it through thousands of years of hereditary tendencies, plus my entire life experience, plus my present personality, plus, plus my present uh, emotional status, you exactly know what I'm thinking and why. Do you, do you have that understanding of God's imminence? We're going to talk about God's imminence today. Not eminence. Eminence is your highness. Okay, anybody here eminent? <laughs> I'm not eminent either. But God is imminent. That means he is here in a way we can't, we, we haven't even really, most of us haven't even conceived yet. Here's some truth. In Christianity, God is not in nature, but nature is in him. Paganism has God in nature. So the tree can be God, and the rock can be God, and the monkey can be God, and the elephant can be God, and the weather can be God, and that is not Christianity. That's paganism. In Christianity, nature is in God. Everything, in fact, is in God in Christian theology. Because there is no existence of anything in the universe outside of God. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, is that true? See, that's why we don't, that's why we don't believe in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in evolution and all that kind of taking place of, on its own. Because we understand that existence, even the existence of a rock, <laughs> it's only, these things only exist in God. In fact, it says uh, in uh, Colossians 1, that scripture, I put these scriptures up here. I'm not going to read them to you. You can look them up. But in Colossians 1, 17, you know, it says that in him, tell me what the next word is. 
The next word is all. In him, all things consist. You get what that means, don't you? Nothing exists or has any uh, substance outside of him. So his eminence is, is the universe itself and all things exist only as they exist in him. Is that kind of deep for you? Do you realize that that is the best possible explanation for physics and what scientists are now beginning to understand about how the universe stays together? The existence of God as a superhuman glue factor in which everything is connected to everything else in this presence of this divine. This is the best explanation for what physicists are now discovering, astrophysicists, as the nature of the universe. I believe the time will come when there won't be a single unbeliever. It's just that most people will be worshiping the beast. <laughs> but they'll be believers. Because it is becoming less and less possible to be an honest scientist and disbelieve that there is supernatural force out here in the universe. All right, point number two. Natural objects cannot be said to be God. But they do reveal aspects of his nature, don't they? Does a tree reveal anything about God? At the very least, it reveals what an abundant God he is. As trees produce fruit and extra leaves even that fall off and fertilize the earth beneath them as the fall comes. And trees produce a place for the birds to have their nests and the various insects. They produce food for the bees and all the other things. It's just astonishing. We have a tree in the backyard that every spring the bees just move into that tree. Now, it doesn't produce any fruit that we would want to eat, but the bees just love the nectar from the little tiny berries that it produces. And those bees are buzzing in that tree so loudly for about a month that when you walk under the tree, and they never bother you. Now, you know, maybe if they get the Africanized kind, they will, but <laughs> they never bother. But you feel like you wonder why that tree doesn't just fly away <laughs> with all those bees connected to it and buzzing like they are. But uh, it's just living with, with the, the life that God provides. So you see so much in nature. You see in the storm, in the, in the lightning, in the waves of the sea. Does not God compare aspects of his character to these things all in, throughout the Bible? Bible imagery is full of this. God compares himself even to the Leviathan and to the, to the uh, great sea creatures and, and to the birds. And, and he compares himself to many, many things, including even stones and rocks and mountains. God compares himself to those inanimate things as well because they reveal aspects of his nature. However, none of them are God. Are we clear on that? So, eminence does not mean that anything that you can see that is material, including people, are God. Finally, man was made to be a temple of God. I'm, I'm tempted to think that this creation of man was actually pretty unique in the whole universe. I believe that he wants all the intelligent beings to be temples for him, and that ultimately they will be. But I believe that he gave man a special, a special potential, at least potential, a special potential connection with himself, which is partly why Satan was so jealous of man and set about to undermine man's relationship with God so quickly. Satan by that time had committed himself to a course of opposing God's purposes in the universe and setting himself up as a rival to God. And in so doing, he could not allow God to develop a possible ally in the human race that would supersede him. And so he had this animosity toward Adam and Eve, our first parents, and he has fooled us into making us think that we are lowly creatures subject to the whims and accidents of nature with no particular connection with God. And Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Amen? 
He has fooled us into thinking that we're just nothing, lumps of clay that God happens to smile on once in a while if we beg him hard enough, and that is not the case. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that we are, this is our character, this is our nature, regardless of our relationship to God, regardless of whether we are believers or not, we are temples of the Holy Ghost and he lives in us. And I see this all the time now that I work with so many people who, who are not declared Christians and I pray with them in the hospital all the time. Be something about my location. I see that people are able instantly to gain a communication with God. People who have never prayed before. People who claim no particular connection with God. And yet, it is such a joy to open that connection for them and have them realize that God is imminent in their lives, and they didn't even suspect it. They didn't even suspect it. It's, 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 it's an amazing thing. So there is a special presence of God within a human being, and he calls that his spirit, which he has given us, even though we haven't asked for the spirit, although we may have, of course, much more of the spirit by asking for him. But this, this connection that we have with God, I believe, is very, very special and unique, and it still doesn't make us God. Are we clear on that? Even if you possess God within your temple, that doesn't make you God. Right? Do people sometimes, however, worship temples? Oh, yes. Yeah, in fact, I have been very tempted to do that myself. You, any of you traveled in Europe? And so many of these small towns in Europe have these magnificent Christian churches that are just, you drive up to this town and the thing that you see from 10 miles out is the top of this church. And as you get closer to the town, you gradually start seeing some of the other buildings around it. But the church dominates the whole landscape. And it's this magnificent structure, which you know took a thousand years to build. And when you actually go and look at it, it just, it, just, it just blows you away. And it's tempting to worship the temple because it's such an amazing achievement. And pagan temples have been worshipped in that same way, including pyramids and other things. But the temple is not the point, is it? It's the house for the God. For the divine, and that's what you and I are. So God's imminence is very important, but do not start thinking, do not start thinking, and please do not report that I am teaching some kind of pagan imminence. I, uh, I will not teach that. It's not true. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I used to limit this verse. I used to think that he was referring only to his disciples. Then I thought maybe I could get in on it if I would commit myself to being his disciple too. Now, I know that he is with his disciples in a special way, but I am now convinced that the Lord is with everybody. That Jesus became God with us, and he is still God with us, with all of us. And through his spirit, he is with every man and every woman. And and, you know, people, again, people feel like God is so far away from them. In many cases, they are hoping that he's far away from them because they do not want to be observed by God because they have the wrong conception of his nature. They think that if they're doing something God doesn't approve of, he must be condemning them. Thank God that is not his nature. He is not a condemning God. He has no reason to condemn sinners because sinners did not choose to be sinners. <laughs> Furthermore, he has already taken the blame for all their sins upon himself on the cross, so why would he condemn them? But people run away from God because they feel condemned, and that is not the way he is. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, let's, let's test this hypothesis of mine that God is with us. We have a number of scriptures here which I have tended to misinterpret, I believe, and maybe by the time I'm done you'll agree with me that I was misinterpreting them, and possibly you have misinterpreted them as well. And so let's look at them. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
that would seem to the, to the uh, uh, pessimistic-natured person, which I admit that I am, and I happen to think most people are, that would seem to imply that there might be a number of occasions when he couldn't be found. Right? Like my wife, you know, she shames me sometimes. This is a characteristic of wives, don't worry. You get used to it. Because I did not take advantage of the presence of a person whom we don't get to see all the time. And she says, you weren't friendly enough. You didn't spend enough time chatting. You're not going to see this person for another month or two. You should have taken advantage of a social opportunity. And I think, oh, yes, you're probably right. That's that, that is, well, yes, we never get enough time to connect. Oh, dear, yes. And so I feel all guilty and horrible and have to admit once again that my wife is right and I am wrong. Which, by the way, is something, men, we need to get in the habit of continually Yes, dear, you are right. The <laughs> happiness that that promotes in the marriage relationship is un unparalleled. All right, so seek the Lord while he may be found suggests that he might not be found sometimes. Again, call upon him while he is near. Well, I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> he can always be found and he's always near. So what's this verse about? Oh, maybe it is that, huh? He can always be found, and he's always near. And what that verse is actually saying is, whenever you become aware of his nearness, don't let that pass. See, because we, we do allow those awareness times to pass sometimes. So he says, when you become aware of his nearness... Make sure that you respond to that. He is near all the time. I'll prove that as we go on through the, through the thing. I just don't want you, like I have done for, for decades, to misinterpret these scriptures and think, well, God is hard to find. Here's another one. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And it sounds like you have to be the one that initiates the drawing near. But that doesn't square with other scriptures, does it? When the Lord says, I stand at the door and knock. Who's drawing near first there? <laughs> so we always have to understand these in the context of the gospel. In the gospel, who comes after whom? Does man come after God or does God come after man? Come on, look at the life of Jesus. In the gospel, God comes after man. So, yes, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Absolutely. If you feel any inclination to get nearer to God, you can be absolutely certain he is motivating that inclination. He himself is drawing you already. And he will not play coy or hard to get. Mostly because he's the one who's been trying to get you to draw near in the first place. Do you get that? We must not misinterpret these scriptures they, if you do so. Because Satan, do you believe that Satan can get in our head when we're trying to study the Bible? I know he can. And he can cause us to read the Bible in a way that is discouraging and depressing. And I'm going to tell you something I've said before, but I'm going to say it again. I don't want you to ever forget it. If you read the Bible and it's discouraging and depressing to you, you are reading it wrong. Even if it's convicting you of sin, that's not meant to be discouraging or depressing. It's meant to be, this is my diagnosis, and I am the great physician who has never lost a case. So let me help you. Never meant to be discouraging. So he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. I read this to mean that I couldn't draw near to God until I first cleansed my hands and undoubled my mind. Now what is that double-mindedness? That's when you have two opinions. You know, I, I like God, but I also like this, and the two are opposed, and I'm not quite sure which one I like more. Let me see the hands of everyone who's never had that experience. <laughs> All right, we're, 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 we're an honest group today. Then We know that we sometimes partly want what God wants and partly want what we want, Right? That's having a double mind. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friends. You cannot fix that. That will go on to the day you die. 
unless you draw near to the Lord and let him draw near to you. He's the only one who can heal that double-mindedness. He's the only one who can. Let's say you really like two girls. Well, okay, girls, let's say you really like two guys. You know how to get over that? Spend all your time with one of them. That will do something for you. It will either make you really like that guy and not care about the other guy anymore, or it will make you really hate that guy and love the other guy all the more. But you at least won't be of two minds anymore. Spend all your time with one of them. It's that way with the Lord. Spend your time with the Lord, and I guarantee you the result will be you'll want him and you won't care about the other guy anymore. Do you hear what I'm saying? He is there. He is ready to, to spend time with you. And he will cure your double-mindedness. So draw near to God so that, not after you have, draw near to God so that you can cleanse your hands and so that you can purify your heart. Not after you've purified your heart and cleansed your hands. That's a good idea, you know, to confess your sins and wash your hands before you come to church. You might say, well, that's what it means, drawing near to God. But the real drawing near to God must take place before you cleanse yourself in a spiritual sense because you cannot cleanse yourself in a spiritual sense until you're near to God. Are we clear on that? I don't hear much, much conviction in your response there. I think that you're still thinking maybe I'm leading you astray. So let's look at some more scriptures here. All right. You will seek the Lord. He tells the, the Jews, after I've allowed you to go into captivity, this is all the way back in Deuteronomy. So Moses is predicting the Jews will rebel against God and go into captivity. And then he says, and when you come in, in your captivity, then you will seek for me, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart. Now, I used to find that verse very discouraging because I realized that I had never done anything with all my heart. You know? You have to be an awfully intense person to do anything with all your heart. Remember again, who's doing the seeking for whom? The Lord is doing the seeking for us. We will find him when we open our hearts fully to him. Anybody have any idea what that means? I used to think, well, maybe I have parts of my heart I don't want him into. Maybe there's parts of my heart which I'm still reserving for my own control. I don't want him into my whole heart. I mean, I can't have the Lord until I'm ready to have him in my whole heart. I can tell you experientially that's not true. When I was only ready to give the Lord 10% of myself, he took the 10%. Isn't he nice about that? And he's continued to accept more and more of me as I've been willing to give more. But that's not even what this verse is about. This verse is about your heart. Brother Randy earlier asked us what the Bible means by heart, and some of you answered correctly. The Bible means your emotional nature. I remind you that our behavior is much more controlled by our emotions than by our beliefs. I believe that eating that much sugar could be harmful to me, but my emotions say, but I need it. Guess which one wins? <laughs> so the Lord is not saying, convert your emotions and then you'll find me. No, 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 no. He's saying, open up. Open up your emotions to me and you'll find me. God has wanted us to love him with our whole hearts forever. He says that over and over in the book of Deuteronomy especially. How do you love anybody with your whole heart? First of all, you expose your whole heart to them. So what kind of things are you going to be talking to God about? Because you can't just say, okay, God, here's my heart, have at it. No, 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 no. He knows your heart already. He knows it far better than you do. He knows how you feel better than you do. And some of you guys are so out of touch with your own feelings and you, and you run from your own feelings and you shut off and you wall off your own feelings because you find it too difficult to, 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 to express them and too painful to experience them. But God doesn't wall off anything. He knows your feelings exactly. 
And he wants you to seek for him with your heart, which means he wants you to open up your feelings to him. Which means you're going to have to open up your feelings to yourself as well. Now, are these all good feelings that you're going to be telling God? You're going to be confessing how much you love your children. <laughs> you're going to be confessing <laughs> what a great attitude you have toward broccoli. You're going to be confessing the feelings that you know are not the same as his. And as you do that, he will reveal to you more and more how many feelings you have that are not the same as his. You know, you say, Father, I'm sure that I love this person, but for some reason I get nervous every time I'm with them and I don't ever want to see them. And actually, I wouldn't mind it if they met an early demise. But I do love them. And the Lord says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm glad you told me. Tell me more. But be, but, but be honest with yourself and with me. Let's talk about your feelings here. See, God is not afraid of your feelings. You shouldn't be either. Face them. Every bad thing you do comes out of your feelings. You have a feeling that is out of whack. So face those feelings. God wants to deal with you on a feeling level. We have been behaviorists. We have been behavior mod modificationists. We, we think that's the way to righteousness. I don't want to be a behavioral saint. I don't want to go to heaven having all these complicated feelings toward the angels and toward all kinds of other people in heaven and toward, toward, toward you and, and, and do all the right things because I should. I want to have the right feelings. Would you Amen. like to have the right feelings forever? Yes. Then your life is in harmony. What gives us so much stress in our lives? Where does all this stress come from? Our feelings. This is not the only cause of stress, of course. But in many cases, our feelings are, are, are in conflict with each other and with, our, and with our sense of right and wrong, too. And so, and so we're in terrible conflict, internal conflict. So he says, you will seek the Lord. I promise you, you will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create circumstances which will cause you to seek me. Isn't he kind in doing that? And you will find me, too, if, just this one thing, if you let me fully in to your emotional nature. I have found no other way to do that than just to talk to God about my feelings. I, I don't know any other way to do that. That's my heart, my emotions, my heart, and I have to talk to God about my heart. But I'm now persuaded, we Adventists believe in sanctification, we believe when Jesus comes we'll see him as he is and we'll be like him. Sanctification can't possibly happen unless we let him have full access to our emotional natures. How many of you agree with that? You know that's got to be true, because sanctification is meaningless unless it reaches our emotional natures. So that's why he says this. Just open your heart to me. Open your heart. I know you can't change it. You can't fix it. Now, here's what God's really like. He's not being elusive, and he's not being hard to play, hard to get. I permitted myself, he says, to be found, even by those who weren't seeking for me. How many of you could, could agree that he's actually done that to you a few times? He just confronted you sometimes, didn't he? He's confronted me quite a number of times, like he did Paul on the road to Damascus. He just con confronts me. I wish he had always done that, because you know, he would have kept me. But then I wouldn't have grown any if he'd always done that. But sometimes he just stops you in the middle of your course, doesn't he? And says, you know, you're having such a hard time here. I'm going to help you out. And he's really after us, friends. And that is the best news I could think of today. I let people find me who didn't even look for me. I said, it almost makes him sound insecure, doesn't it? Like he, like he just needs friends so bad. I said, here am I. Here I am. See, I'm over here. Come on, somebody notice me. It's like those people that jump up and down in front of cameras, you know, hold signs in front of the newscasters and so forth. I'm right here. 
I believe God is constantly trying to get our attention, don't you? Constantly. This isn't just for others. This is for me. He's constantly trying to get my attention. I now see every good thing that comes into my life as a smile, an expression of his love and care, and I rejoice that he's right there blessing me. And then even the bad things are ways of getting our attention. He says, I've spread out my hands all day long to rebellious people. So he doesn't tire. In our entire lifetime, he continues to reach out, even if we're being rebellious. Look, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. That's his constant position. Whenever he's not in, he's right there. But I'm convinced he's always in. I'm convinced that when he says he's standing at the door, it's not talking about he's either in my life or out of my life. He's always in my life. After I'm baptized and actually commit myself to being a Christian, he's even more so in my life. However, I may not be experiencing him much if I'm close trying to keep him out of my feelings or trying to keep him out of my mind. So I believe that the, the door he's knocking at is not an external door. It's an internal door. It's, it's, it's a door to more reality of his personal imminence. When he said to those unwise virgins, I don't know you, are you kidding? <laughs> he knew them better than the best psychoanalyst could know anybody. What he was saying when he was saying, I don't know you, is you have kept me out or attempted to keep me out of the intimate part of yourself. You have never let me really in to who you are. So we don't know each other. I don't know you. You don't know me. Because you haven't permitted me into yourself. This is an inner door, and I believe that we can learn how to open this door. And I, I actually believe that, that that is the most crucial thing we can learn to do as Christians on a daily basis. And even more than once a day, we can learn to open this door. If you hear my voice, you notice not only is he knocking, knocking is a bit impersonal, but he's also speaking, isn't he? How many people really don't hear God's voice? An awful lot of people don't. Is that because he's not talking? No. Our culture now is largely based on the effort to not hear God's voice. We make sure that we're so tired that our brain is half dead. We make sure that we've eaten such poisonous, so poisonously that our brain is half dead. <laughs> we've drunk so poisonously that our brain is half dead. We've lived on stimulants which have kept our brain half dead. We have kept our brain occupied with nonstop media, nonstop so-called connection with other people, which isn't any connection at all. It just keeps our brain occupied so we can't hear the Lord. We have occupied ourselves so that we are preoccupied. You understand the point of being preoccupied? When you don't want somebody else to occupy, you preoccupy. Yeah, you know that one, don't you? It's like that, that, that room in my house that I filled up as fast as possible so my wife wouldn't think of anything to put in there. <laughs> Preoccupied it. And we are doing that with our heads so that God, though he's calling, I don't hear anything. No, I don't think he ever talks to me. I ask people in the hospital sometimes, do you ever hear the Lord talking to you? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think so. Isn't that sad? He's talking to them nonstop. Nonstop. And that's why he says, if anybody hears my voice. So see, there is a role for us to play. Is that role in cleaning our own hands? Oh, no. Getting rid of our own double-mindedness? Oh, no, you can't fix that. Healing our own emotional sickness that causes all of our sin problems? No, you can't do anything about that. What can you do? Listen. I believe that we need to be much more conscious in our listening. You know what I'm saying? You say, okay, God, right now, what I'm doing, I'm listening. 
Now, a good way to get into listening is to open the Bible. Just for a bit. Don't, don't, don't go too far in the Bible. Uh, you'll think that you've had a great devotional time just because you read a chapter. Uh, that's not it. That's not listening. Not necessarily. You might be, but, but chances are not. How many of you can really remember everything you read in that chapter at the, the beginning of the day in, in an hour's time? <laughs> it's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. But it's not the same as hearing his voice, necessarily. Necessarily. What we desperately need to do is to have that quiet thing. And if you're having a hard time hearing his voice, then give him something to talk to you about. How do you do that? I say, okay, Lord, this is how I'm feeling about this. And then see what he says about that. I guarantee you, he'll say something about it. And as you get better and better, you can listen to that. You can hear what he's saying, and you can open the door more and more fully to him as you hear him saying things about it. Uh, you, you say, well, I don't know. That sounds a little, a little subjective. How can I trust my experience? Maybe the devil's talking to me. That is why we must know God's word so we know God's character, and hence we cannot be deceived as to which voice is talking to us. Do not say in your heart, this is actually Paul quoting from Moses. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? In other words, who is going to get me a message from God to bring Jesus down? Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Who's going to get me into connection with Jesus? I need to be connected with Jesus. How on earth can I be connected to Jesus? And here is the answer that Paul quotes from Moses. The word is near you already. Where is it? It's already in your mouth. In fact, it's already in your heart. The word is Christ. The word is his healing power. The word is his creative power by which he gives you new feelings New attitudes. That word is already where? Already in your heart. So if you're opening doors to his voice, you're opening doors within your heart. You are unbarricading your heart and parts of your heart to him. And you're opening it to him by discussing it with him. So here's some practical ideas. I'm sure this is not my final summation of these points because I'm so, I'm just so desperately trying to learn this and still in a learning process, but please learn it with me. Knowing divine imminence. I said knowing, not experiencing, not processing, not finding, knowing. God is already imminent. Knowing, it's the intimacy of knowing. Be as clear as possible about the objective truth as revealed in the Bible. In other words, do be a Bible student of objective truth. Are you with me? We need to know which day is the Sabbath because if you're listening to a voice and it starts telling you, don't worry about the Sabbath day, whose voice are we listening to? The wrong one, the enemy, right? So the more we are, are anchored in objective truth, then the safer it is to hear God. Do you realize that the last generation are all prophets? says that in Revelation. We all gain the gift of prophecy as we come to the end of the world if we're on Christ's side. And, that, and those people have got there because they have the objective truth. They know for sure they're not going to be deceived by, that, by the wrong voice. I used to ask myself, how could Abraham be sure it was God talking to him? Even they asked him to go out and sacrifice his son. You know, how could he be sure it was God talking to him, not the devil? He, he already had such an experience of God's character and nature that he absolutely knew the difference. And that can be true for all of us. It's not, those guys didn't have an experience. Those experiences of the saints of old were not meant to just cause us to marvel and say, oh, how did they get that? Those are all for our example. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? Upon whom the ends of the world have come. We are meant to have those experiences too. Are you with me? You're not saying anything. Has hunger overcome you? Stick with me for another three minutes and we'll be done. <laughs> all right. Secondly, believe that God really is in you. He really is. He's already right there. Listen for his voice. You'll hear it. Stop blocking his voice. In other words, leave time for him to talk with you and for you to talk with him. You know, empty your, uh, your mind of all the clutter and fill it with him. Open your emotional nature to him. In other words, tell him how you feel about things. In fact, tell him how you feel about everything. And especially including the things you suspect your feelings are not quite right about. 
And finally, listen for his healing love. Breathe in his presence. Accept the fact that he wants to be so intimate with you that he's not staying aloof from you, that he's right here and he's ready. If you just open the doors, the more you open the door, the readier he, the more he's coming because he, he is absolutely so much more eager to enter into this connection with you than you are with him. So believe that, trust that, accept that, and let him do that for you. Give that thing a chance to happen. Don't let days and weeks go by without hearing his voice and opening those doors inside of our hearts. 1 Corinthians 3.16, finally, once again, this great promise, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? God is imminent in you, and Satan doesn't want you to know that and wants to steal your destiny from you. But God is imminent in you, and you can experience the benefits of that imminence if you open everything to him. That's all there is. Open everything to him. It's kind of like throwing open the curtains in the morning and letting the morning sunlight come in. By the way, what does that morning sunlight do to that, to that room? It immediately starts to disinfect it, doesn't it? And that's the same way you open your heart, which is your emotional nature, to the Lord and just open it more and more fully. It immediately begins to disinfect it and to cleanse it. Because he is love. He is pure healing love. And he, and he will fix us up. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you for this great truth. And we want to experience, to practice, to know personally and know the benefits of this imminence of yours in our lives. The very thing for which you made us, the very thing for which Satan hates us, we want to fully open ourselves to that so that we can experience your plan for us eternally. Thank you that you are so pure, so holy, and you demand nothing of us except closeness. Oh, God, how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.